The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, I'm David and welcome to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools and appliances just to find out what's inside. Today, I'm going to be tearing down a design classic, the Apple iMac G3. I'm sure everybody will recognize this bit of equipment. The Apple iMac G3 was a, a big game changer in the late 90s, originally released in 1999. It had a big impact on the 90s beige computers, which were clunky and had a lot of cables all over the place. This all-in-one form factor really made an impact on the consumer market. So let's get started and take a look inside. I actually feel like that's a little bit of a misnomer um, because of course, with a clear chassis, you can kind of already see inside a lot of the equipment, but uh, we're really interested to see what is inside, not just the bits they wanted to show us. So the first thing on the bottom is this little expansion port. Now in here, got DIMM, dual, in, dual inline memory module. So this is the sort of only real upgradable part. And yeah, this is uh, 128 meg, I think I've seen. And interestingly enough, inside the port, I can just make out another expansion port. Now, the hint to what that does is this little cable. Cheeky little coax connector on there which tells me that the expansion port is for an airport card, which is what Apple called their wireless cards. Everything else came in built into the PC. You had Ethernet, you had USB, you had a Firewire, uh, and you also had a 56K modem module, which I'm sure we'll find later. I've got a lot of um, sort of personal history and experience from contemporary computers, mostly PCs. Tearing this down will be really interesting because I could tell you a lot about that period of PCs. But this is one of the last generations of power PCs, which didn't use the x86 architecture that most modern computers do. So it'll be interesting to see how different the requirements of the motherboard and everything else on board are. Ah, there we go. Oh, I didn't even know this had an external VGA port. Hidden that well, I can't say I've ever known anyone to use it. There we go. Well, it's fair to say there's a lot of... I'm assuming this is RF shielding because the computer being in a plastic case adjacent to the CRT would have introduced a lot of noise. Most PCs, of course, have a metal case which shields them from any electromagnetic interference. So the fact they've had to introduce this cage tells us a lot about the construction. So we're going, there's the RF cage coming off. Ooh, my first look at power PC architecture. Straight away, we can see uh, got quite a lot of power regulation. I hadn't really expected that. My understanding, because I did a little bit of research to have a vague idea of what was inside before I started, was that most of the power and anything high frequency was sort of in the top half of the case in with the monitor. And that was called the high voltage side and the analog side were sat in there. So on the bottom, I was expecting main PC components or the main computer components. Now at the front, you've got the CD, the hard drive, you've got the two speakers, you've got the IO plates all on board. Got this little daughter board, which I'll have to try and look up what that is. Uh, you've got the dim slots, uh, but yeah, this is definitely a power connector. This is all your voltage regulation. The first observation I'm gonna make, and this is a dangerous one to make, that appears to be the heatsink. Well, actually it's the only heatsink on the main board, uh, which makes me think it's probably the main CPU. Now, if you compared that to the Pentium 4, which was sort of the x86 uh, equivalent, for a, a high-end PC. They were known for being particularly sloppy uh, in terms of heat capacity, and any heatsink on a Pentium 4 would have had a big fan on it, and it would have been a huge chunk of machined aluminium about this kind of big, about five, six inches squared. A processor's heat output is known as its thermal design wattage, uh, and it wasn't uncommon for the heat sinks to have to dissipate up to 150 watts, 120 was very, very common. So seeing a PC that felt as quick as any of the Pentium 4s in a built-in form factor where there wouldn't have been great circulation with a heat sink that big, that's pretty amazing for a PC user of the time. The hard drive, which is up here, and the CD drive down here are interesting components in and of themselves because the hard drive looks like an otherwise reasonably standard device. But if I pull this connector out, so most people would recognize that as a hard drive cable. But if you compare that to the main connection onto the motherboard and the CD drive, they're enormous. 
This is because Max at the time used SCSI as an interface instead of IDE. A little bit sort of redundant now as everything uses serial ATA normally. Uh, but the, the IDE was the standard across x86 PCs. You could get SCSI cards and typically you saw them in servers because you could get ribbons which would connect up to eight hard drives that could be addressed to a single bus. Uh, that was particularly useful when you were trying to do RAID arrays uh, on server storage. Anybody used to modern uh, storage speeds, uh, especially uh, solid state storage, would use something like this and be staggered how slow it is. And also that spin up noise when you first turn it on. And when I tested this before we tore it down, I, I found the, the noises of it starting up and the buzz of the monitor incredibly nostalgic. Press the release on there and hopefully this is going to come sideways. Okay, let's go back to the Wi-Fi. So here's the main motherboard. As I said, oh look, we've got a couple of through board connectors, but also uh, a heatsink, which transfers heat away from a component onto this aluminium sheet. So maybe that's the main power pro PC processor. Yes, on there you have PRX 400 SE. That is your power PC core processor. Well, I suppose the next natural thing to come out is the power supply. Well, that's confused the life out of me. I expected this to be uh, the full power supply taking mains incoming voltage and reducing it down. But yeah, I can't see anywhere that this actually receives the mains voltage from. All of the outgoing connections across here are low voltage. They're the 3 volt, 12 volt, 5 volt, 5 volt ground uh, signal cables that you need to run a power supply. Don't actually appear to include any mains. So where does it get its power from? I wonder how many people that have refer repaired and refurbished and worked on these in the past are looking at the screen shouting now, telling me this is absolutely the wrong way. Oh. Oh. That's torn it. Okay. But it does answer a question. So clearly. All right, yeah, unfortunately I did do a little bit of damage to this bit down here um, to discover that actually these plastics have to shift down and back. You live and learn, I know for next time. CRT monitors or cathode ray tube monitors, they use a stream of electrons to display the image on a phosphor screen. By their very nature, they end up working like a very big capacitor, firing all the electrons to one side. They build up very large charges. Most modern CRT monitors have a bleed resistor, which means they discharge naturally over a reasonably quick period of time. Do not ever assume it's going to be safe to touch one. There are precautions you can take. Until I've removed the anode and successfully made sure everything is discharged, I'm going to be wearing a thousand volt insulating gloves. These are proper electrical gloves. They are not my washing up gloves. They will make sure that I don't do anything stupid and end up putting a big voltage across my heart. I know what you're thinking, and I know it looks silly, but I'd rather look silly wearing these than I would be getting an electric shock. Under this nice big rubber cup is the anode connection. So all you have to do is make sure that's grounded out, touch it, make sure that's discharged, and disconnect it. There we go. Should be safe now. Just in case anyone's interested, on the inside of this cup, there's just a little spring-loaded connector that fits in to the hole on the screen. <sighs> Most of that CRT is loose apart from two connections, and I can't see anywhere to disconnect them on the main board side. I think these must be. There's one. There we go. Wow, that was a wrestle. <laughs> Getting very close to the end now. <laughs> wow. That capacitor does not look happy at all. You can see the size of the bulge on there. That's a 470 microfarad capacitor. Not looking very happy at all. There we have everything from inside a 2001 iMac G3. The iMac was clearly not built for 
speed of assembly or repairability there are dozens and dozens and dozens of screws and if you compare this to a contemporary ATX P uh, PC I would comfortably say there are probably four times the amount of screws but the form factor, the size, the, the compact nature of it and it is engineered to the nth degree. Everything is exactly where it needs to be. There are a lot of clever features which make this a tiny but well engineered machine. It's very, very clever and incredibly well thought out. Considering the sheer size and complexity of the assembly, uh, the very few components are kind of electronically interesting. Uh, I think I have them here, which are the HV board, which essentially is sort of the power supply because it takes the mains intake from the plug, runs it down to low voltage and then distributes it round. Also contains the high voltage components which run the CRT monitor. Of course, we have the electron gun and the CRT here. We also have power management board. I don't know if that's the official name, that's what I'm going to call it. And the compute board, the low voltage board. Now, I really struggled to work out how the power is derived for the computer. Obviously, the low voltage board, uh, you want clean power regulated as smooth as it can possibly be. You can't have any halfway rectification. You, you, your smoothing has to be spot on. Any volatility in the five volt, three volt, and 12 volt lines are going to cause the computer to crash. So what you actually have is sort of multiple stage rectification, smoothing and power quality management. So you put power in here, goes through all the components on here. You've got some relays which control the CRT and you can send off voltages that side. Also got the transformers and the main cap, which again, that's really bulging, makes me very nervous. That then sends the mains voltage fairly dirty still through this connector on the bottom of the logic board or the low voltage board. And you can see these really large traces run around the outside of the board over to this connector, which is this one, which is where it connects onto the power quality board. So this is taking in power from the supply and running it through the RMs. Now, they are going to be smoothing it, managing the voltage, making sure they are absolutely spot on the 3.3 required volt, the five volt and the 12 volt. And then that feeds the power back into the low level, uh, low voltage board and onto the computer. It's an interesting way of doing it. I, I feel it's kind of being forced by the size of the container. I don't think anybody would choose to have dirty voltage and clean voltage on the same board. Uh, and that sort of added to the complexity of this board. So any issues you have on this side means it's likely to actually start interfering, potentially damage the logic board as well. Uh, I see that as kind of a weakness in the design decision making. Otherwise, this is uh, a very simple power supply. There's lots like it it's dc to dc power quality in conversion one final thing on the high voltage side i just wanted to mention is a, some of the audio amplification actually comes from the hv board now that might not seem obvious the speakers are driven from the logic board when it's turned on but as soon as you press the power button and start the boot sequence you get that distinctive apple chime sound that has to be derived from this board so this board has some basic sound equipment, the incoming power supply, the CRT power supply, um, audio amplification. Yeah, there's a lot going on for a, uh, an analog HV board. And finally, we have the power PC board. So they've got a lot squeezed into a very small form factor and you sort of see this happen again and again, especially with the iMacs, the all-in-one form factors, where they've started to use fairly repeatable laptop components to try and squeeze everything into the back of those chic aluminium PCs. Um, I don't think anything on here really qualifies as that, but it's certainly a very, very squeezed mainboard. Now, I was just going to pop this little daughter board off, see if we can work out exactly what it does. On one side of the board, you've got the Firewire controller, and on the inverse side of the board, you've actually got an Intel chip, which is the network driver. And um, they're still, the connector's pretty far away from where the ports are. And I kind of wonder if they put these on a door to board because they're both a high speed, high frequency switching kit, which probably means that uh, they're isolated on a board for just a little bit of electromagnetic interference. Remaining on here, you've got the VLSI chip, which unfortunately is sort of a bespoke integration chip. It's got an Apple branding on it, which means we're unlikely to find out much about it, but they will have integrated on here a load of some of the smaller chips, just so it's a neater package rather than having multiple ICs spotted around the board. On the underside, you've got the main power PC component, uh, main power PC processor. And over here, you've got the daughter board with the 56K modem. If you've never used a dial-up modem 
lucky you. <laughs> um, it, it's not something that I'm nostalgic for or miss. Uh, that's that's a relic well confined to history. Uh, it's on a daughter board. I would almost certainly think for uh, voltage segregation. Uh, I personally have worked on PCs that were still plugged into the phone lines and got little electric shocks because they drive at 50 to 70 volts in the UK at least, uh, depending on whether they're ringing or in standby. Personally, and this is just my opinion, I prefer more accessibility, more replaceability, more maintainability. There have been a lot of sacrifices in the name of making this small and chic and certainly my experience of PCs in that time frame, the ability to replace components was invaluable. Nobody wanted to be replacing their entire PC if a single thing failed. But I do have to give them credit, this is a beautifully designed piece of equipment. I found the inside of the iMac absolutely fascinating. It's been really interesting to see the design justifications they've made to squeeze everything into that beautiful aesthetic chassis. If there is anything else that you think would make an interesting teardown, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Let us know what you'd like to see inside. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.